Welcome colleagues, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Andrew Coates uh, from the University of Warwick, UK and president of the Heart Failure Association. I'd like to welcome you to today's Heart Failure Association webinar entitled 10 Commandments of the 2021 ESC Heart Failure Guidelines. It's my great pleasure to be joined today by the new presidential trio of the Heart Failure Association. So I am the outgoing president who will hand over on September 1st to our first speaker, Professor Giuseppe Rosano, who will then be the president of the Heart Failure Association for the next two years. We then hear from Professor Marco Metra of University of Brescia, Italy, who will be then the new incoming president elect of the Heart Failure Association who will take over in two years time. So you really do have the people who uh, will be leading the Heart Failure Association. The aim of this webinar is to give you a better understanding of the key messages from the 2021 ESC Heart Failure Association guidelines. The session's interactive. We strongly encourage you to participate by sending your questions and comments at any time during the webinar through the chat. And we'll have 15 minutes at the end of Q&A and we'll address issues that come up in the discussion. For the best learning experience, we do invite you to participate in the discussions and give your feedback. This program is supported by AstraZeneca in the form of educational grant. Um, and it's my great pleasure now to hand over to Professor Giuseppe Rosano from St. George's Hospital Medical in London for the first presentation on his choice of the first five or five of the 10 commandments. Giuseppe. Uh, thank you, uh, Andrew. And uh, here is my uh, declaration of interest. Uh, when we look at the guidelines, I mean, they're, they're very extensive and it's uh, always difficult to find uh, the main te uh, 10 messages. Uh, but we have a, a paper from uh, Mariana Damo and uh, the uh, leading uh, uh, authors of the guidelines, Marco Metra and Teresa McDonough, who have selected the 10 commandments that will tell us what to do in uh, all the main uh, issues to uh, tackle in patients with uh, uh, heart failure. I've uh, uh, chosen, uh, in agreement with uh, uh, Professor Metra, uh, these uh, five uh, uh, commandments, and Professor Metra will follow on the others. Now, we've uh, uh, we have witnessed a very significant change in uh, the uh, treatment of heart failure with reduced ejection fraction since the 2016 guidelines. You can see that we, we had very significant trials coming in. Uh, um, um, patients with uh, with SGLT2 inhibitors. We had uh, very important information coming from uh, Verisiwat on the Camptic Merck bill and additional data with um, uh, ferric carboxymaltose. But the uh, very important changes were uh, those related the, to the positioning of the SGLT2 inhibitors in uh, uh, the guidelines. And in fact, when we look at the uh, totality of evidence, when we looked at the totality of evidence and we incorporated that into the guidelines, we see that we have uh, four classes of drugs that have uh, 1A recommendations. And these are the ACE inhibitors, the beta blockers, the MRAs, and dapagliflozin or empagliflozin. For, uh, these are the drugs that we sh uh, should be always used in order to reduce the risk of hospitalizations or, and death. Then we have secubitary valsartan that is recommended as a, ACE a replacement for the ACE inhibitors in those patients who are still symptomatic and tol can tolerate at least 10 milligrams BD of an alapril or equivalent ACE inhibitor. But the big change in uh, the guidelines, in uh, uh, the algorithm, has been to move away from the stepwise approach into a more horizontal approach where Patients at any encounter should uh, be treated with the fantastic force, with the four pillars. So the ACE inhibitors, beta blockers, MRAs, dapagliflozin and empagliflozin, ARNI if uh, indicated, and then the loop diuretics to uh, treat fluid uh, um, retention when appropriate. I will go into details later on uh, uh, device uh, uh, therapy. You can see that then once we have uh, applied the four foundation therapies, then we can select to uh, use a, a phenotyping uh, 
of our patients according to the different comorbidities in order to give um, uh, a, an indication for class 2 or other class 1 interventions. So in, for patients with uh, non-ischemic etiology that are still have, um, uh, that are still symptomatic, uh, um, we can, uh, uh, there is an indication for coronary artery bypass grafting. In those with iron deficiency, the use of ferric carboxymaltose. Those with atrial fibrillation, the use of digoxin and pulmonary vein ablation. In those with heart rate in sinus rhythm and heart rate greater than 70 beats per minute, uh, the use of um, uh, ivabradin. And uh, Professor Metra will uh, touch upon the uh, mitral valve uh, repair. Uh, later. The main problem uh, has uh, emerged on uh, uh, how we implement the uh, guideline-directed medical therapy now that we have to use four uh, foundation therapies together. I have to say that it's very, very rare to see patients who are completely naive on medical therapies, where we need to start with uh, from scratch. In the vast majority of cases, our patients are already on an ACE inhibitor or a beta blocker or an MRA or an SGLT2 for other reasons. So the, the question is to add another one. But in those few cases where we should start from the beginning, now we know from uh, the CBIS2 that we can start an ABC inhibitor and a beta blocker together without any problem. Of course, we shouldn't st be starting a beta blocker before an ACE inhibitor as CBIS3 demonstrated that if you do so, patients tend to have an increased risk of hospitalizations. We, another important piece of information is that we can start the SGLT2 inhibitors at any time. These are drugs that are very easy to use. They do not require any titration. Should, therefore, should, they should be implemented without, any, without waiting any further whenever we encounter patients with heart failure and reduced ejection fraction that are not receiving them. So being that in uh, the outpatients, being that in uh, uh, a nurse's vis home visit, or being that after uh, or at discharge. So there's no reason to withhold the SGLT2 inhibitors. And we also know that we can start the MRA because of their significant benefit and the neutral effect on blood pressure when the blood pressure is, is low. But in order to guide the, uh, uh, the uptitration of medical therapies with, uh, with the Heart Failure Association, we, have, um, uh, we ca came up with uh, a patient profiling uh, because we recognize that there are issues like uh, heart rate, blood pressure, C present, uh, renal function. They are very important in how you uptitrate medical therapy. So what is important is that you start with a, with a foundation therapy and then according to the blood pressure, heart rate, seek, presence of CKD, then you decide which of the other drugs between, among, between beta blockers, ACE inhibitors, and MRA, you want to uptitrate first. So start first with the four, and then according to the patient profile, uptitrate accordingly. Then when we look at the other main message on, uh, from the guidelines is that CRT in selected patients with uh, left ventricular function less than 35%, sinus rhythm and cure arrest less than or greater than 130 milliseconds. So if we look at the patients with um, in sinus rhythm and uh, left vent uh, ventricular function less than uh, 35% and uh, a cure arrest greater than 130 milliseconds, we have an indication for CRTDP or, T or CRTDP with uh, different um, uh, indications according to whether the QRS is between 130 and 149 milliseconds or is greater than 150 milliseconds. You can see here that the CRT is recommended with class 1A recommendation in those patients with a left ventral branch block QRS morphology and with a left ventricular ejection fraction le less than 35%, whilst as a class 2A recommendation for those who have a QRS duration of one th between 130 and 149, with a left bundle branch block QRS morphology and a left ventricular function less than 35%. In those patients with a non-left uh, non bundle branch block QRS morphology, we have an indication that is uh, 2A for uh, those who have a QRS duration greater than 150 and 2BB for those with a QRS duration between 130 and 149. So 
that is important, but also what is important is that whenever we have a class 1A recommendation for CRT rather than RV pacing for those patients with heart failure and reduced ejection fraction, regardless of the New York Heart Association class or QRS width, we have an indication for ventricular pacing. So whenever there are non other non um, heart failure related indications for pacing, and the patient has already been diagnosed with uh, heart failure, then there is a clear indication for CRT rather than right ventricular uh, pacing. And in those patients who are receiving re uh, already, who had already received a permanent pacemaker with um, right ventricular pacing, and they need to change the uh, generator, then there is an indication to um, up, uh, upgrade to a CRT. So, Looking at the uh, change, in uh, uh, change in recommendation, you can see that now the, uh, uh, there's been a, uh, the uh, curious duration of a, uh, a 130 to 149 with an LBB curious morphology has been downgraded for, uh, for class one to class uh, 2A. Whilst in patients with, uh, with already received a conventional pacemaker or an ACD, and uh, they uh, uh, um, uh, develop worsening heart failure, then uh, uh, they have a significant RV pacing, then uh, the recommendation has been upgraded from uh, uh, 2B to 2A. This is, uh, um, uh, the, all these new recommendations are based on a better understanding of all the clinical trials that we have available so far. Then regarding the ICD, we can see that uh, we have uh, uh, an indication for our class 2A for the known ischemic. This is mostly the, um, uh, the aftermath of the uh, Danish trial and uh, uh, a class 1 for, uh, the ischemic, uh, for ischemic patients. So we know that now we have a 1A recommendation for an, ACD, uh, an ICD to reduce sudden death and or cause mortality. In patients who have recovered from a ventricular arrhythmia causing the hemodynamic instability, who have um, uh, a reasonable uh, long-term uh, uh, survival with good functional uh, status. And that is for secondary prevention. And 1A uh, for primary prevention in uh, uh, those patients to reduce the sudden death and all cause mortality in patients with symptomatic heart failure with ischemic uh, uh, etiology at, at least 40 days after the myocardial, myocardial infarction. Whilst if you look at the uh, patients with uh, non-ischemic etiology with 11 ventricular function less than 35 percent despite more than three months of optimal medical therapy then uh, the class of recommendation for an, a, an ICD is uh, 2AA. So what is new for the ICD? For the ICD, there has been a, uh, uh, the indication for patients with uh, uh, non-ischemic etiology has been uh, downgraded for class one, from class one to class 2A. That is the main change that has occurred in uh, uh, these guidelines. Another important part of the guidelines has been uh, dedicated to the pre-discharge. And this is because it's been, uh, uh, it, it is uh, evident that a significant proportion of patients with uh, acute heart failure are discharged with minimal or no, weight, no significant weight loss. And uh, most of them are still have uh, a lot of congestion and congestion is often the cause of uh, recurrent hospitalization, but also of uh, recur um, uh, readmissions and mortality. Therefore, there is a clear indication to um, uh, optimize uh, not only the diuretic dose, and uh, that is to control con congestion, but also to optimize medical therapy at discharge. So, in uh, uh, what is important is first of all is to try to keep in patients who are admitted with ac uh, acute decompensated heart failure to keep, if possible all the optimal medical therapy. Uh, there can be uh, uh, slight changes or adjustment uh, according in if there is a more dynamic instability, but the op uh, optimal medical therapy should be continued throughout admission. And once the hemodynamic uh, stabilization is achieved, then uh, treatment be, uh, should be optimized. In theory, in, uh, this is in theory, in practice, what do you do? When, pa when patients start to, uh, to eat, 
then uh, you should uh, switch into the oral uh, oral therapies or uh, preferentially oral therapy and you can keep some others some of the uh, other therapies iv so uh, the treatment optimization should relieve the congestion treat the comorbidities especially those related to future events and this is especially uh, iron uh, deficiency and uh, to treat or restart the oral optimal medical uh, therapy and you can see that now we have a recommendation a recommendation 1c that uh, patients hospitalized for heart failure should be carefully evaluated to exclude persistent uh, signs of congestion this is very important because it will lead to keep our patients in for one or two extra more days and it's more important and also from an economic point of view it makes more sense to keep that patient in for one or two days rather than discharging and have them they come back in a month or two where the uh, uh, as we know that one day of acute hospitalization for heart failure costs at least 1500 euros per patient now it is also recommended with a class 1c that uh, the oral uh, medical uh, treatment should be administered before discharge and that patients should be seen in outpatient clinics one or two weeks after discharge now uh, how this is achieved it will uh, the very much depends on the different realities will depend on uh, the settings it will depend on the organization of uh, care but the early follow-up visit should include monitoring for signs and symptoms of heart failure the assessment of volume status and uh, readjustment of diuretic dose then the blood pressure heart rate and laboratory measurement that will it should include the renal function electrolytes uh, iron status if that has not been assessed prior to uh, discharge and uh, if, uh, uh, that is when we can start also to up titrate some of the medications that have already restarted that have been restarted at, or been is commenced at discharge of course we know that uh, for some of the uh, of the drugs as the SGLT2 inhibitors have only one dose and should not uh, be uh, uh, won't require any further optimization the other com uh, the other commandment that uh, uh, I will tackle is the ferric carboxymaltose in iron deficiency we have one recommendation that is recommended that all patients with heart failure should be periodically screened for anemia and iron deficiency with uh, um, a full blood count of course but also ferritin concentration and t size now we, uh, how we define iron deficiency iron deficiency is a serum ferritin concentration less than 100 or a serum ferritin between 100 and 299 with transferrin saturation less than 20 percent it is important to recognize that iron deficiency can occur in completely independently from anemia and has a completely uh, independent prognostic value from uh, anemia the other recommendation is a, a 2AA for the intravenous iron supplementation with uh, ferric carboxymaltose in symptomatic patients with a left ventricular ejection fraction less than 45 percent iron deficiency with uh, the criteria I've described uh, earlier the third recommendation is a 2AB for I IV iron with ferric carboxymaltose in uh, patients who have uh, recently been hospitalized for heart failure a left ventricular ejection fraction less than 50 percent and iron deficiency so you can see that there is a difference between those who are chronic stable 45 percent and those where the recent hospitalization where the left ventricular function should be 50 percent this is based on the results of the affirm ahf data, uh, study that uh, demonstrated 20 uh, a non-significant 20 percent reduction on the primary endpoint of um, um, hospitalization and death with a neutral effect on cardiovascular death but a significant effect on hospitalization we have to say that the affirm hf was uh, uh, significantly affected by the covid pandemic and the analysis of the covid with a for covid sensitivity analysis that basically has censored uh, all patients on the 3rd of march 2020 when uh, um, covid 19 has been uh, classified by the who as a pandemic and therefore any patients who were 
who has been hospitalized for uh, with and had a positive uh, swab for COVID was uh, labeled as COVID and any that was uh, uh, in patients who were positive was related as COVID rather than cardiovascular. Then you can see that uh, 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 censoring at that uh, point in time led, uh, demonstrated a significant reduction in uh, uh, the primary endpoint and the hospitalization. So these are the first part of uh, my uh, uh, of the first five uh, commandments. Of course, we always need uh, uh, to get the balance right between what is suggested and reflect before implementing all the guidelines, taking into account the specific patient characteristics. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Giuseppe, for getting us started and your selection of five of the 10 commandments. I'll now hand over to Marco Metra from the University of Brescia to give his five commandments to make up the full 10. So Marco. Thank you very much for uh, the invitation and the topic. Let's start, these are my disclosures. Okay, and just uh, uh, one one thought. When we think about the Ten Commandments, we uh, are used to think about something terrible and uh, somehow devastating on our life. Instead, uh, uh, um, I think, and I thank Mariana Damo for uh, picking up the figures and the pictures. Uh, uh, we were much more friendly. And, uh, and we wish to be uh, in uh, the future. Uh, so I will uh, take care of the last five uh, commandments. It's not all the guidance, it's just uh, uh, they are, uh, however, some aspects that uh, uh, have been uh, highlighted in some way. Uh, first of all, um, as uh, already Professor Rosano showed, we have uh, uh, considered the different uh, uh, phenotypes of heart failure and this may be based on either the severity uh, and the clinical presentation of the syndrome or based on uh, comorbidities. So first of all, uh, two aspects regarding severity and clinical presentation. First, advanced heart failure. Advanced heart failure has been uh, uh, defined uh, in the current guidelines uh, in agreement with the position statement by the HFA issued a few years before. And we have a definition that it is based on the severe, severe and persistent symptoms of heart failure, New York heart class three advanced or four, a severe cardiac dysfunction, which may be either systolic defined by low ejection fraction, uh, may be a right ventricular failure alone, or maybe uh, even a, a diastolic dysfunction, mainly a diastolic dysfunction, with, however, IBMP or anti-proBMP levels that, uh, um, that uh, uh, show that are consistent with, uh, uh, with the abnormality of cardiac function. <clears throat> a third aspect is uh, the uh, uh, unstable clinical course with episodes of pulmonary or systemic congestion requiring uh, high dose IV diuretics, and then the severe impairment on quality of life and enterprise capacity uh, with uh, uh, the patient that we, uh, who may be uh, even unable to exercise at all. Uh, based on these criteria, uh, we uh, define a patient population which is at high risk of event, uh, events. This is uh, an analysis that uh, we did uh, uh, in uh, uh, four centers in Italy, and uh, which has been uh, accepted as a late uh, uh, breaking uh, uh, observational study at the HFA meeting. And we show that uh, uh, when the patients fulfill all the four criteria for advanced heart failure, we come to a patient population with a 60% event rate, which means death or uh, heart failure hospitalizations at one year. So the criteria outlined by HFA really, uh, really uh, select a high-risk patient population. Uh, 
what uh, should we do in this patient population? This is the algorithm that has been uh, uh, included in our uh, guidelines. And you see that uh, a central role uh, is uh, uh, taken by mechanical circulatory support. We have short-term mechanical circulatory supports, which should be considered in patients in Intermax class one to uh, four, actually. Uh, so patients who are in cardiogenic shock, who are unstable on IV inotropes, but also patients who need uh, continuous IV inotropic therapy or who are uh, in any case in, uh, with an unstable clinical course. So this may be considered for short-term mechanical security support. Then, uh, um, then they uh, may be uh, list, must be listed, sorry, uh, to heart transplantation if they have no contraindications, or they, um, they should be considered for long-term mechanical circulatory support with a class 2A recommendation again, uh, if, uh, um, uh, if they have a contraindication to cardiac transplantation. Then uh, MCS, LBED may be a destination therapy or uh, may be a, a bridge to decision to uh, our transplantation. Of course, then we have palliative care and everything for the patients who have contraindication to these uh, um, devices. Um, another important aspect that has been uh, highlighted regarding, the, uh, regarding advanced heart failure is that uh, um, um, we must consider not only patients with severe symptoms, class three to four, but also patients who have less severe symptoms, but who have, uh, we can call them red flags in these cases, uh, uh, we have uh, uh, some characteristics uh, that uh, point out, that show that they are at high risk. Uh, this may uh, include uh, frequent uh, heart failure hospitalizations, uh, a very low ejection fraction, the need of inotropic therapy, lack of tolerance to renin angiotensin system uh, uh, inhibitors or ARNI or beta blockers, worsening renal or hepatic function, and so on. Uh, it's also important to, uh, to point out that these patients at high risk must be referred to an advanced heart failure uh, center. And the HFA is doing uh, a lot uh, to uh, I like the centers of uh, excellence for the treatment of heart failure in our countries. Uh, Another uh, um, aspect, another commandment regarding the acute heart failure, uh, patients who are uh, at, uh, um, in unstable clinical conditions who seek medical uh, uh, treatment and, uh, um, and that uh, often be uh, hospitalized uh, for their unstable clinical conditions. In uh, the current guidelines, uh, we have uh, defined four clinical presentations of acute heart failure, uh, therefore acknowledging that uh, it is a very heterogeneous uh, clinical syndrome. And uh, we have the most frequent clinical presentation of acutely decompensated chronic heart failure, but we also have patients with acute pulmonary edema and in this case, uh, uh, peripheral uh, uh, factors, uh, namely uh, uh, increased afterload, may play a major role, and uh, uh, cardiac function, systolic function, may be uh, normal, at least uh, uh, with, uh, for, with respect to its major aspects. A third clinical presentation is the one of isolated right ventricular failure. And lastly, uh, we have cardiogenic shock. Each of these uh, presentations uh, uh, deserves a, a specific uh, treatment with the treatment algorithms that are uh, different according to each of these clinical presentations. Uh, one thing uh, to point out is the role of vasodilator and inotropic therapy. Uh, there, there has been uh, less enthusiasm in these last years uh, 
for uh, IV vasodilators uh, and uh, they have a class 2B recommendation. So they still may be considered, but they are not mandatory uh, for the treatment of these patients with acute failure. And the reason for this is that we have uh, two randomized control trials based uh, on the comparison between a regimen based on IV vasodilators followed by oral treatment versus a, a traditional uh, therapy uh, left to the investigator. And both trials uh, showed the neutral results with respect of uh, the comparison between a vasodilator-based regimen versus uh, traditional uh, treatment. Uh, of course, uh, the also inotropic agents have a class 2B recommendation. So they may be considered in patients who have a low systolic blood pressure and who have signs of peripheral hypoperfusion. But of course, we have to uh, keep in mind that they are potentially harmful for the outcome, the outcomes of the patients with heart failure. And therefore, uh, they uh, should not be used until, uh, unless, uh, uh, each, uh, unless needed for hypoperfusion. Uh, we have the, the uh, 2A recommendation for short-term mechanical circulatory support, and we already talked about this. Uh, third uh, commandment uh, in my uh, domain regards atrial fibrillation. Atrial fibrillation is probably the most frequent comorbidity in the patients with uh, heart failure. And you know that uh, uh, it, uh, uh, it has a, in some way a synergistic uh, uh, relationship with uh, uh, our failure itself. Uh, we have uh, uh, class one recommendations for the patients with atrial fibrillation, and namely, uh, these regard the need to treat the triggers and the concomitant uh, heart failure and uh, the indication to uh, direct oral anticoagulants uh, because of the thromboembolic risk of these patients. Then uh, we have uh, uh, the different strategies of rhythm control or rate control. And going to rhythm control, a, a major role is given to pulmonary vein ablation. This is a class 2A recommendation. Therefore, it should be considered in uh, all the patients uh, in whom uh, symptoms of atrial fibrillation uh, symptoms uh, uh, may be at least partially related to atrial fibrillation. Uh, this uh, uh, recommendation uh, differs uh, slightly uh, from uh, the uh, recommendation of the atrial fibrillation ESC guidelines issued the year before. And the reason for that is that uh, according to our analysis, uh, we um, do not think that we have enough data to recommend AV um, uh, pulmonary veins ablation uh, for the improvement of outcomes. We have had a trial, EST uh, FNET, uh, showing a benefit of uh, early rhythm control versus usual care on outcomes. However, only 19% uh, of the patients uh, were, sorry, uh, were uh, treated with pulmonary vein ablation in this trial. Then we, had, uh, we have had Kessel AF, a trial showing an almost uh, uh, a 38% reduction in uh, our, uh, our failure hospitalizations or death with pulmonary vein ablation compared to uh, medical treatment. However, uh, this trial um, um, had uh, uh, some limitations with respect of the outcomes analysis. You see that the primary endpoint was met in a relatively small number of patients, 51 versus 82. Uh, and you see that the population was highly selected, 363 of 3,013 patients. And it was not blinded, and there was a crossover between the two treatment strategies. Thus, even if uh, the evidence in favor of symptoms improvement with PV ablation was overwhelming, we do not think that uh, the outcome analysis was uh, strong, uh, um, uh, comparatively strong. 
Uh, this is another uh, trial, this is uh, from Cabana. In this trial, <coughs> uh, the, uh, the, the endpoint uh, was neutral. However, an analysis limited to the patients with heart failure showed a reduction in the primary uh, outcome uh, with the PV ablation versus drug therapy. However, also this uh, uh, trial has to be uh, taken uh, with uh, uh, some limitations. I'm sorry that the text doesn't show, uh, but uh, um, uh, it must be pointed out that less than 20% of the patients had a low ejection fraction and 80% uh, of the patients had an ejection fraction above 40%. So uh, uh, the results may not necessarily be, uh, um, uh, be applied also to patients with a low ejection fraction. Uh, this is another uh, analysis uh, uh, published recently in the European Art Journal showing that the number of deaths and hospitalizations in the uh, trial of PV ablation versus medical treatment was uh, very uh, low. So further uh, trials would be uh, needed. What about uh, treatment of uh, secondary mitral regurgitation? Uh, this is the algorithm in the current heart failure guidelines. We have three components. First of all, to the upper left, uh, uh, treatment uh, of uh, uh, mitral regurgitation with surgery in the patients who have an indication to surgery for cabbage. Second, optimization of medical treatment and devices, uh, because we know uh, that this may uh, cause a regression of severe mitral regurgitation in a, a meaningful proportion of patients. And then uh, lastly, a class 2A recommendation, so it should be uh, uh, considered, uh, for uh, percutaneous treatment in the patients who fulfill the COAPT criteria. This uh, because of the COAPT trial uh, very uh, clearly show the benefit of uh, device therapy, uh, percutaneous uh, correction of mitral regurgitation versus medical treatment uh, on heart failure hospitalizations and heart failure hospitalization and deaths. And uh, uh, but it must be uh, it's important to uh, remember that the criteria uh, were rather stringent in this trial, and uh, 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 the trial excluded patients with a very severe left ventricular systolic dysfunction, with high uh, pulmonary artery pressure, with uh, uh, right severe right ventricular dysfunction or tricuspidal regurgitation or hemodynamic instability. And actually, uh, further studies like this one uh, showed that, that uh, the patients are not fulfilling the COAPT-like criteria have a, a much uh, poorer outcome uh, compared to uh, uh, the patients uh, who fulfill the COAPT criteria when treated with uh, uh, percutaneous uh, uh, treatment. Uh, going back, uh, it's also important to remind, however, that the class 2B recommendation, so it may be considered, may be reserved for the few patients who uh, have a mitral regurgitation treatable with surgery and who are at a relatively low risk, or uh, to the patients who do not fulfill the COAPT criteria but who can still be uh, uh, treated by percutaneous treatment. Then, of course, we have uh, palliation. Uh, last uh, uh, comorbidity uh, regards cardiac amyloidosis. Uh, much uh, improvement, much progress has been done with this uh, uh, cause of uh, heart failure and mainly uh, heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. Uh, we know that uh, uh, there may be hematological abnormalities that can be found by uh, the detection of uh, uh, serum and the urine uh, protein electrophoresis. And, th and then we may have uh, TTR cardiac amyloidosis that can be detected by cardiac uh, spect with uh, bone marrow uh, scintigraphy. Uh, 
uh, based on the results of these uh, uh, exams and in some cases based on uh, biopsy and based on cardiac uh, magnetic resonance we may have a diagnosis of a cardiac amyloidosis and we now have a specific treatment for TTR cardiac amyloidosis with tafamidis uh, which improved the uh, outcomes uh, compared to um, uh, traditional treatment in this uh, long-term randomized control trial. Therefore, uh, to conclude, uh, we uh, are used to 10 commandments, at least uh, for people like me in the Cecil B. the Mill uh, movies, and uh, there was something terrible, and they are terrible because the commandments are uh, very uh, mandatory in our life. Uh, we have commandments for our failure, and uh, we hope they are uh, less terrible, more friendly, but uh, more, uh, but uh, of uh, major help for our patients and nonetheless. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Marco, and thank you also to Giuseppe for two excellent presentations. We have a very large number of questions coming in, so clearly there's a lot of interest very much in the recent guidelines. Um, now, could I just start off, and I guess one of the big take-home messages from the guidelines, uh, Giuseppe, I'll direct this to you, is the concept of the foundational four treatments. And at very many meetings, I've also heard a sense of greater urgency to get all four of those treatments on board as quickly as possible. And the position paper that you led on the patient profiling was, was partly to, to try and help doctors in how to do that quickly. Now, I noticed in one of your presentations, um, in one of your slides, there was the comment that it is recommended evidence-based oral medical treatment be administered before discharge. It's not entirely clear whether the guidelines are saying you should accelerate the use of these four drug classes when a patient's still in hospital, but you could read into that comment that you should make efforts. Can you give a little bit flavor on how quickly we should start those four drug classes? Um, I mean, it very much depends on uh, the organization of care. If you have an organization of care where you can see a patient uh, one week after discharge and then after two weeks and then maybe followed by heart failure nurses, then uh, you can start with two or three, as I said, and so ACE inhibitors, beta blockers, SGLT2 inhibitors, and then up titrate the others. If you have a, an organization where patients are lost at follow-up, you cannot see them after um, before than three months or one month, then what is important is to get all the four on board and then up titrate later. Because it's uh, what has been shown recently is that the, four, for the full foundation therapy is more effective than the uh, one or two medications at full dose. So it's rather bet it is better to do that. And the way you should do, it's, uh, it very much depends on the organization of care. And uh, because it's been shown that in many countries, if you don't start, the medications are at uh, discharge, then patients have never started. Okay. Now, there's a follow-up question there from Dr. Bartolotti. Um, what's the role of nursing, counselling and outreach in the post-discharge period? You've said if you've got one, if you've got the other, what should you have? In terms of uh, nurses? I mean, yeah, or and post post discharge follow, -up and have, yeah. which disciplines? Yeah, we are very very uh, we are very uh, fortunate in uh, the UK and uh, in uh, Northern Europe to have uh, the nurses that can up titrate medications and uh, can take the lead into that. I I know that in other countries like um, in Italy, in uh, uh, Spain, but in, uh, uh, it, that is not possible. So uh, uh, nurses will be crucial, and uh, uh, I foresee then uh, in all other countries where that is not yet possible, changes will be we should should be made in order to make that uh, possible. Um, I'll turn to you now, Marco. There are a couple of questions about more advanced heart failure. 
And one of the questions is, when would you consider the introduction of some of the treatments that are down beyond the initial treatments for people who are clearly not quite responding or failing? And there's a particular question about when would you consider the introduction of either very ciguate or omicaptive macabre? Uh, very good question. Uh, first of all, if if I may, I would uh, uh, reinforce what Giuseppe Rosano was saying regarding the early initiation of all four drugs uh, as soon as possible in the patients without failure because in it, uh, in, we are still hearing, uh, I mean, too much details. Uh, we know that uh, we like to think about our practice as something uh, very complicated, uh, but it may not be the case. And SGLT2 inhibitors probably, they are not the case. They are very, they are much easier to give uh, than other drugs. Uh, then what about advanced heart failure? Uh, I, uh, when, when I lead the first position statement, which was 2007, uh, we were just thinking of uh, uh, identifying uh, patients that deserve something more than usual medical treatment. Uh, now you mentioned the Verisiguat, and uh, uh, it is, uh, uh, this drug is somehow limited uh, by the design of the Victoria trial, where uh, it was uh, given to patient with, uh, patients with a worsening heart failure event. On the other end, uh, there has been uh, this analysis depending uh, where patients were, uh, uh, where uh, it was uh, assessed uh, uh, whether the time from the last heart failure event uh, had uh, an influence, and actually the drug uh, seemed more effective uh, when given uh, um, at, uh, at, at a larger interval from the first event. So uh, it may not be that the Risiguat is effective just in patients uh, with a worsening uh, heart failure event, but this is the Victoria trial, and uh, uh, we have uh, somehow to stay uh, with the results of this trial. Um, and... Uh, um, uh, on the other end, we have omecantive macabil that may become approved in the next uh, future. Uh, this drug has different characteristic. Uh, it, in, it increases uh, cardiac function, and, uh, um, and therefore it may be particularly uh, indicated in uh, patients uh, who have uh, uh, signs of hypoperfusion, uh, who have uh, uh, lower, uh, the lowest ejection fraction uh, and uh, uh, low systolic blood pressure as uh, uh, in uh, our analysis. On the other end, also this drug uh, was uh, um, uh, shown, uh, shown as effective uh, in overall the patients with uh, R failure and reduced ejection fraction. So we have two drugs that uh, are surely uh, very much indicated in uh, patients who do not uh, tolerate uh, uh, traditional treatment. Uh, who, uh, who have uh, uh, severe symptoms and or hospitalizations uh, despite the traditional treatment, but their indication may be even in a larger group of patients. Uh, the other thing that uh, it, uh, probably is not covered enough in the co uh, current guidelines, because we tend to be uh, conservative with the guidelines, are the devices like uh, CCM, like uh, uh, baroreceptor uh, stimulation, and uh, like interactual shunting. I mean, there are many uh, uh, devices that, uh, um, of course, act independently uh, from uh, neurohormonal therapy and uh, uh, may be considered uh, to a larger extent in these patients who continue uh, to uh, be at, a, at high risk despite uh, traditional therapy or who do not tolerate the traditional therapy. Okay, thanks. Could I just ask you a quick question on acute decompensated heart failure? There are a couple of questions and you mentioned the fact that routine intravenous vasodilator therapy is not needed. But there's a question about whether you use nitroglycerin or morphine 
um, regularly in managing acute decompensated heart failure? Uh, there are different things. Uh, morphine actually has uh, uh, some uh, propensity uh, uh, analysis uh, showing, uh, uh, suggesting that it may be even detrimental. And uh, uh, there is uh, also uh, one uh, um, prospective trial uh, with uh, comparison of morphine with midazolam done in Spain, uh, also in this case uh, suggesting uh, that uh, midazolam may be better than morphine. Uh, so it must not be used routinely, and it was all already written in the guidelines. Uh, nitrates uh, are uh, surely easier to use, uh, and I would still uh, recommend them in patients with uh, uh, high systolic blood pressure. Uh, what is true is that uh, uh, a regimen based on nitrates in all the patients uh, uh, is not more effective than uh, frosamide, actually, uh, with respect hey. to evidence. Thanks very much. Oh, I'll go back to Giuseppe. There are quite a few questions, as you might expect, on SGLT2 inhibitors, because that's the new entry into the guidelines, and it's gone right to the top as one of the foundation four. Um, a couple of related questions. Should SGLT2 inhibitors now be on the discharge protocol checklist of something that should be started unless there's a reason not to? That's question number one. Should it now be a, a sort of almost a mandated checklist thing? And the second one is, do we recommend SGLT2 inhibitors or do we recommend specific drugs? Is there a class effect for the recommendations? Um, uh, first question is easy, they should. Uh, and for the very reason that they have a very significant effect and very rapid effect on hospitalizations and mortality. So the longer we wait, the uh, higher the probability that that patient will get a rehospitalization. So they should be on the uh, checklist also because of what uh, Marco was saying earlier. The fact that they, have, uh, they are void of any uh, effect on heart rate and blood pressure and therefore is uh, they're very easy to use and they should be started. Regarding which drugs, I mean, we have evidence for dapagliflozin on the reduction of uh, uh, heart failure hospitalization and death, but also reduction of uh, uh, cardiovascular death and total death. Whilst we have evidence for empagliflozin for the cumulative endpoint of um, uh, heart failure hospitalizations and death. Uh, so these are the only two drugs that uh, should be recommended. In those patients who, are, uh, who also are diabetics, we can uh, recommend sotagliflozin if it's in the market, if it's on the market. But mostly, uh, dapagliflozin and empagliflozin. Okay, and a quick follow-up. There are a couple of questions. The inevitable one, which of the four foundational drugs do you start first? And is there something like a correct sequence? Uh, uh, as I said, it's very, very rare to have uh, patients who are completely naive. I mean, we looked up back at our series and we found that uh, less than 0.5% of all patients we see are completely naive on any medication. So the patients are often in, in, uh, on some medications. So if you have to start, I mean, it's the ACE inhibitors and beta blockers can be started together, as I said, with the SGLT2 inhibitor. Then if you if patient can tolerate also an uh, MRA, but it's uh, at least start with three and if possible with all the four together. But if you cannot see patients within a reasonable time, say two to three, uh, two to four weeks, then try to start all the four together. Okay. Marco, I'll come back to you. Um, you went through in great detail the sometimes confusing literature on how to manage atrial fibrillation in heart failure. Um, you know, the, the, I love that castle and uh, cabins. Um, but there's a question there. That I guess the bit that we didn't cover so much today was the use of NOAX in heart failure with AF. What would your recommendation be for those? Uh, NOAX are recommended, are mandatory, and uh, <clears throat> this, uh, this has changed already, was changed already in the atrial fibrillation guidelines. Uh, NOAX are now class one recommendation. Uh, 
and uh, they are first choice uh, uh, rather than vitamin K uh, antagonist, except in the patients uh, with uh, valvular heart disease, which causes heart failure, or with uh, uh, valvular prosthesis, mechanical prosthesis. So no act uh, must be given. Okay. Um, now, back to you, Giuseppe. Uh, we've only got a chance for a couple more questions. But a couple of questions more specifics. Do you have concerns about prescribing SGLT2 inhibitors in patients with recurrent urinary tract infections is one. And a second one is after how many hours or days from an acute admission can you start an ARNI? Yes. Uh, now, regarding the first question, if there, there are uh, recurrent uh, ITUs, then there is a need for a specialist assessment because it's uh, that it, you need to remove the cause of the uh, ITUs. Uh, 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 once that has been uh, cleared, then uh, you can start the SGLT2 inhibitors. But if they are very recurrent, uh, means I mean more than three or four per year uh, per, per year, then uh, uh, probably you should wait until that patient is seen by a urologist. Uh, the second one was uh, rega uh, re was on uh, sacubitril valsartan, and uh, we have a class two B recommendation to start in patients who are naive. Or regarding the other patients, it would, uh, uh, there is an indication to first uptitrate the ACE inhibitors. Patients should be able to tolerate ten milligrams BD before being switched. And there is evidence in the Paradigm HF that those patients who were not on uh, an ACE inhibitor did not benefit from Secubitary Valsartan. So I would stand uh, with the recommendation that uh, you should only switch those patients who are uh, clearly um, uh, 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 on with, with the requirement, uh, with, with the uh, characteristics of the Paradigm HF. Okay, we've only got chance for one last quick question, um, and it's a, it's a good one. Um, you recommend iron deficiency screening periodically. How frequent is periodic? Is it weeks, months, years? Um, either discharge or within one month if it's not done at discharge, and then every six months. Every six months. Okay. Thanks very much. Um, I'll sum up now. We've just got a couple of minutes left. Um, I thank Giuseppe and Marco for two excellent presentations, uh, dividing between them 10 commandments. Now, I looked at the 10 commandments and they were largely things you shouldn't do, whereas our commandments and the guidelines are largely based on things you should do. So I think that's a step forward in 2000 years. Um, so it, it's really good and they're very important. Guidelines are that. They're ways we should be reminded to improve the outcome of our patients, we should improve the quality of the care. And we have so many effective therapies now, it's behoven upon us all to do our best efforts. And I think what these guidelines are telling us, much more than, than past guidelines, is that our job is not done when the trials are published. Our job is not done when we present the results, that we, our job is not even done when we publish the guidelines. We need to make sure they're implemented and we need to address the barriers, the clinical concerns, the individual patient factors that are necessary to actually achieve the benefit. The statement that a drug that works is one that's taken is critical, that we cannot allow this extremely slow uptake of guideline-directed medical therapy. We need a sense of urgency, both for our individual patients and implementing the guidelines. So I'd like to thank Giuseppe and Marco very much and the audience, fantastic questions coming in now. Um, I'd like to close by summarizing how important guidelines are. And I encourage you to go back and look at the 10 commandments paper, the guidelines as well, but they are slightly longer and complicated, but have it available for uh, referring to in your routine practice. We'd like to thank AstraZeneca for their educational grant that allowed us to bring this program uh, to us. And you're able to watch this webinar on demand on the ESC 365 uh, website. Thank you very much.